So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Hisham, and thanks very much uh, for inviting me for this talk. Um, uh, I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon in Southampton, uh, which if you want to know where it is, is very much in the south, uh, on the uh, south coast. Um, I've been working with uh, HPB team in Southampton for the last seven years, and uh, we are mostly uh, famous for the laparoscopic liver surgery in Southampton, we do about between 50 and 60% of our liver dissections laparoscopically. So uh, this time uh, I, I will talk about the liver anatomy and maybe for some of you, it will be principal uh, knowledge. And then uh, in the last few slides, I will share with you a right hepatectomy uh, laparoscopic. I will uh, try to make it short as possible. Um, liver, as you know, is the largest organ in the abdomen. It has got a dual blood supply and it's commonest site for metastasis uh, from uh, not only GI tract organs, but as well from breast and lung. And around 50% uh, of patients with colon cancer, they will develop liver metastasis at some point, whether it's 25% uh, of them are synchronous metastasis and the other 25 is thought to be metachronous, uh, wh whatever the definition of that will be depending on the time length between uh, the primary uh, uh, interval and secondary formation. And it's one of the commonest organs uh, to be involved in trauma and it's a, a relatively easy organ to transplant technically. Uh, the problem with transplantation, as you all know, is mainly related to uh, post-operative care. So in the past, the old-fashioned liver anatomy, they used to classify it as right and left low, but actually this is not a functional, it, it could be categorical classification, but it's not functional. It doesn't take into consideration the uh, blood supply of the liver. And therefore the liver anatomy classification has passed through different stages of evolution. And probably the most important one, you can see uh, the latest to the conoid and the business classification. And these are what we uh, currently really uh, use uh, to classify our liver anatomy uh, in terms of liver resections. So the liver basically, instead of classifying it into the old left lateral and uh, it's con so the old left and right is now considered left lateral and right uh, dry uh, segmentectomies. So therefore the classification should be uh, the left and right is divided by the line connecting between the vena cava and the gallbladder, which is an imaginary line uh, that you can, if you run through it, it will come on the middle hepatic vein. And the middle hepatic vein will divide the liver into left and right side. Uh, the segment one is usually in the back, which is the caudate lobe, but then uh, you run by segment two, three, and four. Four uh, will be subclassified into segment 4A, which is at the top, and segment 4B, and then you run the clockwise segment five, six, and seven, and the division between each each segment each uh, section is uh, dependent on the hepatic vein uh, run through. So the left hepatic vein will divide it into left lateral segment and middle left segment, and the middle vein will divide uh, will uh, subclassify it into right side, and the right hepatic vein will divide it into right posterior section and right anterior section, which is segment five and eight. So uh, likewise, the uh, portal anatomy divide the liver into main left and main right. And then on the right, the portal vein will give the branch, which is called the anterior uh, sectoral branch and posterior sectoral branch. Uh, and in the, in the left is a little bit different because the left portal vein will run through the portal fissure 
and then give branches to segment two and three and two branches to segment four A and four uh, B. Uh, in the child, in the, no, in, the, in, the, in the infancy, the portal vein, of course, as you know, connected to the umbilical vein, and this is uh, the white representation of the falciform ligament. And that uh, in the uh, uh, after after birth, that ligament will gradually closes up and form a ligament. But it recanalizes in the portal hypertension, and quite often we can see it open even during liver resection if the people has been affected uh, in li with liver cirrhosis and uh, portal hypertension. So this is another view to show you the left lateral segment, segment two, three, and run always run clockwise, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, and eight. And you can see how clearly the left and middle hepatic vein in 15% of the population, they run into a single trunk into the vena cava. And that's why sometimes it's, uh, although you can, you can see it, but it is endangering, damaging the middle vein when you do the left lateral uh, uh, sectionectomy. And therefore you should be careful about it and studying the preoperative CT scan is quite important. Uh, when you see there is a common trunk for both of them, you need to make sure that you don't damage the middle hepatic vein. <clears throat> So this is again another picture which shows the same classification with the uh, recess of re uh, as a landmark of the falciform ligament and where is the left lateral sectionectomy landmark going to be where you can uh, transect the liver directly through that line uh, without damaging the branches to the uh, right uh, to the uh, segment four and four B. Uh, likewise, the main sutura uh, which is on the back of the liver, you can make it as a landmark for the uh, posterior sectoral uh, branches, and you can ligate these branches intrahepatically when you do posterior sectionectomy. The group in, in uh, Budapest, they've done very nice work on uh, this uh, specimen on the liver where they plasticize the liver by injecting plastic material to the dead bodies and uh, leave it for a while and then uh, hydrolyze the liver cells where you can get the shape of the vasculature of the liver. What is important here, uh, you can see that the arterial anatomy and how this is closely in contact with the biliary anatomy. The main issue with that is when you do a gallbladder surgery, you need to make sure that you always stay. So if, we, if you run a line uh, on the uh, left side of the gallbladder, you need to make sure that you never exceed that line to the left of the gallbladder. Similarly, the caesura or the fissure, you need to stay always above it to avoid injury to the duct. And these are the commonest mistake people they do with the gallbladder surgery where they can injure the main bile duct or the right posterior sectoral duct as well. So this is the uh, Cantley's line, which is the imaginary line that runs between the gallbladder and the vena cava. And uh, it is the imaginary line that will be equivalent to the middle hepatic vein as well. I always wondered why, why did they call it hilum, hilum or hyler plate. The hilum by the Latin means that there is nothing, which means that if you put your right angle or lay here uh, dissector in that area, you should not be damaging anything. There are no major, but you may see small branches, small blood, blood vessels that can't bleed at this point. And this is always the first step I do when I do a right hepatectomy. Uh, that I put a dissector in the hilar plate so that it can split the hilum and can show me later on when I need to transect the right hepatic duct uh, without uh, damaging or endangering a damage to the 
left duct. And therefore, it's quite important that you know the hilum has got nothing. And if you do uh, a right angle dissection there, it's quite safe. The similarly here, you can see that this is the hilar. So this is where you can put exactly above the left hip, that's the left hepatic duct and the right hepatic duct going behind the gallbladder in that area, exactly. <clears throat> you can put your dissector safely without damaging any of the major vessels or the, or, or the ducts. Only 40% of people, they will have a conventional arterial anatomy to the liver, i.e. that they have got a common hepatic artery that's divided into left and right hepatic artery. Quite often, uh, when you do liver surgery or, or even pancreatic surgery, actually, you need to study the arterial anatomy uh, very well, make sure that there is no accessory or replaced hepatic artery. We quite often see a replaced hepatic artery coming or accessory hepatic artery coming from the SMA, superior mesenteric artery. And in particularly with Whipple's procedure, you will need to be very careful about that because damaging this artery uh, may endanger the healing of hepatic of your hepatic jejunostomy and can uh, endanger future um, sepsis to the liver and, and future abscesses within the liver because of the uh, deranged healing or uh, a deteriorated healing of the hepatic jejunostomy and sepsis. Um, 70%, so we've got now the uh, portal vein and the uh, hepatic artery, 70% of the blood supply to the liver is, uh, 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 sorry, 70% of the blood supply is coming through the portal and 25% is uh, arterial. However, it's about 50-50 where the oxygenation coming, but consumes, the liver consumes 25 uh, percent of the total body oxygen. Therefore, the blood flow through the uh, portal vein is quite significant and any uh, injury to the portal vein or why do you dissect through the portal vein and you get bleeding, it's usually a significant bleeding as the, as the flow is more than two liters per minute and that's quite significant and can cause uh, damaging and significant bleeding during that time. We usually can control any bleeding by the Pringles maneuver where you can uh, squeeze the portal vein and the hepatic artery together. Be careful about the timing where you leave your clamps around it. You can use a non-crushing clamp. I usually use a tape and a sort of a tube, NG tube and squeeze on it. Uh, and if I do that, I'll try to do it intermittently. I use a 10 minutes. Um, uh, ischemic time followed by five minutes reperfusion. And thereafter I use 15 minutes interpreted uh, Pringles maneuver with, uh, I, I usually try not to exceed the 60 minutes. Uh, if you exceed the 16 minutes, don't be surprised if you get, if you get uh, elevated lactate and elevated uh, liver enzymes post-operatively. Uh, therefore ischemic uh, preconditioning is thought to be uh, helpful. Um, if you do a total vascular occlusion where you uh, dissect, where you, uh, sorry, where you clamp the portal structures as well as the hepatic vein, then the total ischemic time usually goes down to 45 minutes. Usually in my experience, it's not necessary to do the total vascular occlu occlusion unless the uh, tumor is actually attached to the uh, uh, vena cava. So liver resections can be uh, lobar, single lobe liver resection or extended lobar resections and uh, segmental and subsegmentals. The argument whether it is better uh, oncologically to uh, do anatomical resection versus segmental resection has been refuted in many publications, which we can suggest that the anatomical resection is better. But actually with the uh, colorectal liver metastasis, there was no different. And if you think about it, the more parenchyma, functional parenchyma you leave behind, the better for you in the future that you can go back again and you do redo liver resections. Whereas if you do anatomical liver resection, 
then once you get a recurrence, you haven't got much enough place or time or, or, uh, or parenchyma to play with. And particularly if you've sacrificed major uh, inflow or outflow of the liver. Uh, over the last 20, nearly 30 years, I mean, in the UK, the experience started nearly in 1985 with liver resections. In 1980 and 90, the average liver resections that's been done in the UK does not exceed 10 per unit. And uh, I mean, per department. Uh, until uh, beginning of 2000, when the number started to increase significantly uh, after uh, noting the significant advantage of liver resection for colorectal liver metastasis. And therefore, it has been decided centrally that all liver resections should be centralized to um, uh, specific departments, HPV units, and currently in the UK, there are 27 units that perform liver surgery, and uh, uh, these are usually divided regionally. So in the South, we've got two, two centers only to do liver resections. And uh, therefore the experience, first of all, the experience has been concentrated and we each unit will perform more than 100 to 150 resections per year on average. So the liver resections, it's either right hepatectomy, left hepatectomy, and by taking the middle vein, you will subclassify it into right extended or left extended hepatectomy, depending if you sacrifice the middle vein or you don't sacrifice the middle vein. Um, then we have got a left lateral sectionectomy uh, where you take only segment two and three or central hepatectomy where you take segment four, five, and eight only, and leaving the right and left hepatic veins, these ones behind, so that you can take only the central uh, segments. Usually it's, uh, it's very well known that central hepatectomy is probably the most difficult procedure, and usually it has got um, uh, the uh, 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 higher risk of bleeding compared to the uh, left or right hepatectomy anatomical resection. Anterior sectionectomy, where you resect segment five and six, and you can involve segment four B with it, or uh, nowadays we do even posterior sectionectomy, either by uh, preserving the right vein or re-implanting the right vein uh, by taking a segment of the right vein and then re-implant it. Usually we use uh, 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 the same vein for reimplantation, or we use a saphenous vein for reimplantation. It's not very commonly done, I can tell you, and uh, the success rate is not quite high. Therefore, we prefer to do really anatomical, proper anatomical resection. And right posterior sectionectomy is, is uh, uh, when you take segment six and seven uh, of the liver. Most important thing uh, for planning resection of the liver is you need to have a relative uh, or relevant indication for liver resection. Cancer is, is one of the indications. Uh, the solid indication is colorectal liver metastasis. Uh, however, there are other metastases that we currently uh, resect as well, particularly um, uh, renal uh, cancer liver metastases uh, and the neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, breast liver metastases, it, does we do we do do it particularly for triple negative uh, triple positive breast cancers? Uh, we did some for triple negative, but I must say the outcome doesn't look great. People they get usually remetastasis, uh, a recurrent disease in few months time. And in my experience, I wouldn't uh, really do it unless the patient is very fit and unless they have got a really, really good response for preoperative chemotherapy. And the most common indication for doing breast liver metastasis is uh, to give the people uh, or to give the patient a period of chemotherapy free interval with liver resection. So if they, want, if they have been on chemotherapy for three, four years, the oncologist would ask me to take the liver uh, tumors out if they are resectable, and therefore they can give them a, a chemotherapy free period for about a year 
until they get recurrence and then the, they, they do give them a second line chemotherapy. It's very important you go through the CT scans and particularly triple phase CT scan. Um, almost always we do uh, MRI scan for the liver and it's one of the uh, standards now for our practice that we never do take liver resection without MRI scan. And particularly in the era of chemotherapy, where you get lots of uh, chemotherapy induced injury of the liver, we even repeat the liver MRI scan following the chemotherapy so that we can compare it with the preoperative, with the pre-neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Um, I must say that the PET CT scan, although we do it, but it's not the standard, Lots of the units, they make it as a standard, uh, but we do it only on specific indications. Proper mobilization of the liver, take your time, and particularly if you're doing a right-sided liver resection, take your time, do a nice job, get the liver up of the uh, diaphragm and get it up of, out of the vena cava. The, 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 bet, the better mobilization you do for the right liver, the easier is going to be your resection and the easier identification of intrahepatic anatomy. There's no necessity actually, if you do liver resection with the right and left sided uh, standard liver resections, there's no necessity that you go through the detailed anatomy of the intrahepatic uh, liver vessels. The more you know about it, the better to preserve uh, uh, vasculature for future resections but it doesn't, in, in general, it doesn't endanger the life of the patient if you do transection. For example, in Germany, I've seen them using uh, staplers, lots of staplers, and um, there was no problem with their practice. However, when you come and do extended resections, this uh, using staplers for blind transection of liver parenchyma is going to be problematic. Um, as standard, we do an intraoperative ultrasound scan usually, and that's whether it's laparoscopic or open procedure. Despite the fact we don't actually pick up any new lesions on the ultrasound, but the main reason we do ultrasound is that we identify the uh, hepatic veins run through so that we, if we want to preserve, for example, the middle hepatic vein, we try to preserve it as much as possible and make your decision uh, comprehensively. We do it with, uh, within an MDT, the strategy, whether we want to do an extended liver or we do, for example, a two-stage resections uh, and plan it again with your colorectal uh, surgeon's colleague, whether you want to do your liver uh, resection first or color colonic resection first. In general, the principle for that decision is made, which is the most endangered to the patient. If the liver metastasis is the difficult one, then your decision going to be take the liver first. If the liver metastasis is not a difficult one to deal with, then it's better always to take the colon uh, first before you do the liver. And identify your main inflow and outflow at the beginning that will reduce the amount of blood loss during the procedure and uh, uh, try to avoid, of course, R1 resections. What is the volume that you can leave behind? When I used to work in Leeds uh, with Peter Lodge, uh, the professor, um, he used to tell me uh, you can take 80%, but actually 80% is quite a lot. And I've seen lots of people who uh, exceed that limit, they go, they do go into the problem of uh, small for size. And therefore, in general, my practice now, if I think I will need to take more than 75% of the liver, I will do portal vein embolizations prior to uh, uh, liver resection. So this is um, an example how we mobilize the left liver. And you can see this is the left liver. Usually I put a swab behind the left liver that will bring the uh, triangular left triangular lig ligament very clearly, and you can use your diathermy just to transect uh, through. However, you reach into a danger area where you have the phrenic vein and the left hepatic and uh, the left hepatic vein, which can bleed. And therefore, once you reach in that area, you need to be careful about the dissection.
So that that's just to show you. Then uh, you expose the suprahepatic uh, vena cava. And usually there is a groove between the middle vein and the right vein. Within that groove, it's almost always there are no branches. And you can use your um, right angle or lehi to form a tunnel where you want to, uh, to, to, to encircle the right hepatic vein and dissect it and transect it before your uh, uh, planned resection. And you see, you see that that groove is very clearly here. So you can see that this is the right, this is the middle, and that's the groove where you can use. And usually the groove direction, this is what I always tell my trainee, the groove direction, it isn't uh, parallel to the vena cava. It's usually that line. So it's usually directed towards the heart. That's the usual direction of that groove. This is the bare area of the, of the right liver. And this is, again, the groove between the middle vein and the right hepatic vein. The bare area has been exposed. The uh, right liver is now to be mobilized and lifted up. And then after that, you can see the space between the vena cava and the liver. And that's when the right liver has been lifted up and careful dissection in that area to expose the vena cava. Uh, usually the um, adrenal gland will be in that space. It will be shown in a minute. So that's the area, the bare area of the liver or the area of the right triangular ligament. And you can see now the vena cava it's just to be exposed there. Once you start to lift up, then there'll be the small branches between the liver and the vena cava. And that's clearly here, the vena cava has been exposed into the same dissection. And gradually you can clip or tie. I usually tie all these small branches between the vena cava and the liver until I expose the uh, right hepatic vein. So what is the normal volume? Usually the, the volume itself may not be ind indicative of, uh, of the future liver function. We take it as a proxy. So if there are small, for example, if you're doing uh, right extended right hepatectomy and you've got small segment two and three, it may be functionally sufficient for that patient if he is of low weight or, or thin patient but usually uh, as, as, as a general proxy, if we see a small left lateral segment, then we try to avoid major liver resection. And we usually go for a right portal vein embolization to allow for the growth of the left side. Uh, now you may know that in Japan, they use a functional liver assessment, which is the ICG test. It isn't taken any popularity in the UK. Uh, it's been used in Manchester for research purposes, but not more than that. And in general uh, agreement in the UK and the general practice is that we, defend, we depend on the volumetric assessment. And as an assessment of segment two and three represents usually 15% of the liver. Uh, segment one and four, usually about 20% and segment five and eight, uh, which is the anterior sector, is 30% and segment six and seven, which is the posterior sector, is about 35% of the liver. So this is a very generic, and it just gives you some guidance on how much you're going to resect of the liver. Uh, then in transplant units, they use the CT volumetry. Uh, more and more, there are new programs now coming to the market as well, which can show you in 3D dimension, uh, 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 how is the liver going to look like after the section and what exactly you're going to sacrifice in terms of uh, the uh, liver drainage and the liver anatomy. Uh, I find it useful and helpful in uh, live related transplants. 
Um, we have just started to use it in, um, in, in, in cancer surgery as well. But again, it didn't take popularity. It's a little bit, uh, it acts extra cost to the procedure itself. And we haven't found it so far uh, very much useful to, uh, to do it as a standard of practice for cancer surgery. And you can see here, for example, in this specimen, uh, I, I, I'm planning to resect the uh, right liver. And this will tell me how much I can leave of, uh, if I take the right liver, how much I can leave of the uh, middle hepatic vein, and therefore uh, can be helpful in future regeneration of the left liver. So for all the options for inflow control, you either go for a complete uh, clamping of uh, the portal structures, where you call it a Pringles maneuver, or selectively you can take the right uh, portal and right hepatic artery structures. And it depends on, uh, we used to do that quite um, uh, as a standard way uh, to take the right hepatic, uh, right portal vein and right hepatic artery. However, more recently, particularly with the uh, popularity of laparoscopic resection, uh, we are more and more doing the transection without going through that procedure. It, it saves time and we didn't find much difference in terms of blood loss as well. Uh, in particularly the posterior sectoral, you can take it through the incisura or the fissure, and particularly if you're planning a right posterior, laparoscopic right posterior sectionectomy, this will be useful. Encircling the vena cava, suprahepatic and infrahepatic, I've seen some people doing it. I must say, uh, in my experience, it's not useful uh, unless you are losing lots of blood, which you shouldn't. Uh, of which blood loss in a major liver resection should not exceed uh, 700, 750, maximum one liter. And therefore, uh, we certainly find it that total vascular exclusion is uh, not required at all. Now, what we use for parenchymal transection, uh, as you may know, in the UK, the standards we use the CUSA but it is quite useful that you know how to use the finger fracture technique or Kelly, Kelly clamp technique. The reason is not unusual that you get your, your, you get your CUSA failed or the machine uh, broken down and you end up having no machine to do, so it's only your hands. Um, yes, we, uh, the, the water jet technique is popular in Germany, it's not in the UK. Harmonic scalpel, we use it, but again, this gives you blind dissection and doesn't uh, clamp the vessel selectively and doesn't particularly clamp the uh, uh, pedicle structure selectively. Therefore, the risk of leak from harmonic scalpel is higher. Uh, the radiofrequency ablation, which is the, if you heard about the Habib uh, sealer, uh, they use it in Imperial College. Uh, it didn't take any popularity actually in the UK. Some centers in the States, they started to use it. But again, the same issue with the stapler devices, it is a blind technique and it doesn't uh, give you um, exposure to the intrahepatic anatomy uh, properly. So this is a picture of right hepatectomy and uh, the same patient after the right liver has been mobilized completely. And this is a standard right hepatectomy. So therefore the segment four has been preserved as well as the middle vein has been preserved. Uh, I wouldn't expect that this patient will struggle postoperatively in terms of liver regeneration. Uh, Left-sided resection, you can see that the caudate lobe here is exposed, this one, and the vena cava on the back, and it's a, a, an anatomical re left resection, with, and you can see the middle vein exposed here and dissected and clamped all the branches ac uh, across the middle hepatic vein. 
and bilobar or double uh, resection when you get, uh, if you, I try in this case to preserve as much as the outflow as possible. So therefore in this one, I decided not to do uh, left lateral section and I just resected segment three so that I can preserve some parenchyma for segment two and the left hepatic vein as well as the uh, middle vein has been preserved here. Therefore, the patient, I don't think he will struggle postoperatively. Uh, you would expect some elevation in liver enzymes and bilirubin, uh, but not beyond a couple of weeks, three weeks time, and the liver function should go back to normal. What do you mean by double hepatectomy? So like... So, so hepatectomy from the left side and the right side together on the same sitting. Okay. So this is segment three, you can see. Segment three has been resected and segment five, six, seven, and eight resected. And similarly here, you can see that the posterior segment seven has been resected. And uh, segment two, uh, segment three. So that's segment three and part of two and four and segment seven and part of segment eight as well resected. So that's on single sit on single synchronous resection both sides. I would so with this one, for example, the right hepatic vein has been uh, sacrificed. Therefore, you would expect some ischemic changes in segment six. You can see it here. However, this is not. Yes, you would expect some uh, uh, transaminase elevation postoperatively, but it's still acceptable because you would get some outflow through that segment into segment five, and it can uh, it can regenerate. Uh, uh, so people, they usually don't have a post-operative liver problem or liver failure. Uh, hemostasis. Uh, in open technique, I really, best thing is to use your hand, sandwich the liver, get it, uh, and just be patient with your uh, timing. You can use all the kind of sealers, the, uh, thrombine sprays available and uh, taco seal and flow seal patches. Um, but actually if the liver is bleeding, it's usually, usually a surgical problem and you just be patient, press on it and wait, Get give the anesthetist enough time to uh, correct the clottings and uh, the numbers. Uh, usually I would wait 20, 30 minutes and uh, seldomly that you need to use any of these uh, clotting factors. And to be quite honest, we mostly use the clotting factors just as a finishing before we close up rather than uh, to control the bleeding. The taco seal, I must say, which is the adhesive pads. Yes, we have used it when you have got a, a slightly problematic bleeding from a bigger vein such as the middle vein and it gives a good results. So probably I would say this is the uh, uh, most um, uh, eff eff efficient product. One last point I would like to talk about for uh, uh, within, within the gallbladder. When you do a gallbladder surgery, as much as you can, if you keep yourself that's the line, imaginary line that I draw usually in my head when I do gallbladder surgery. If you keep it uh, to the right dissection, to the right of that line, and above the fissure, which is usually here, then you almost certainly, you're not going to injure any of the biliary structures. Of course, that doesn't uh, preclude you from having a window of safety which should be a very generous window of safety for any gallbladder surgery. So these are just some uh, post-operative problems from uh, liver and uh, uh, probably bile leak and abdominal collection are the most difficult ones to deal with. Uh, post-operative bleeding shouldn't be a common occurrence I must say I have only one case where I needed to take back to theater for bleeding. And quite often when you take it back to the bleeding, you'll find the bleeding is stopped. So you end up just washing and pack it and, and deal with it. Um, uh, but I have never 
uh, regretted actually taking back people to theater if I need to, uh, or as I feel washing out the bleeding is going to relieve future complications such as collection and abscesses. Liver failure, uh, it usually happens only after major liver resections. I had a patient with, where I did a laparoscopic right a couple of weeks ago. His bilirubin second week went up to 130, and uh, third week, actually, uh, it started to uh, gradually come down. So if you have, and the main thing, the main thing when you think about liver failure, if you have left enough liver drainage, you should not have problem with post-operative liver failure or insufficiency. So I will go now, uh, I think I've got a few minutes to show you a video. Take your time, we have time. Okay. Can you see my screen or not? Can you see my screen? It is distorted. Distorted? Yes. Now is it better? No, it's the same. You mean uh, hazy? Uh, it is compressed. Okay, just a second. Now? No. Not yet, no. So you can't see anything? No, I we see, we see a, a table with some wording and it is uh, deviated to the right. Okay, so we see you closing yeah. like a screenshot from when you were closing the the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let me close the PowerPoint, probably it's easier. Now I'll start to share again. Can you see it now? Yeah, I think so, but mm -hmm. yeah, yes, but yeah. it is, uh, yeah, it flew a little bit. Yeah. It's pulsating. Okay, so, so this is a, a right hepatectomy and you can see that this is mobilizing the right liver. Uh, so on the left hand side there, you see the liver is being pushed by my assistant mm. and I'm trying to clear the triangular ligament. So then after mobilizing the liver, uh, finding out with an ultrasound, with the help of ultrasound, where are the veins, and particularly I'll be interested in the middle vein, as in this case, I want to save the middle vein. And if you see that the first line I have drawn with the diaphragm, with the diaphragm, is the course of the middle vein, and therefore my transection will be a little bit deviated of the middle vein so that I can save it. And in this case, I have taken uh, almost all the structures um, outside the liver. So the right, the, there is a red sling, blue sling, and the uh, yellow sling. Um, sorry. Sometimes I use this tape as a lifting, so I insert the tape between the middle vein and the right vein to lift the liver as in hanging maneuver. Not necessary, I stop doing it most of the time, but if it's easy to do it, it helps you to bring the structures that you want to preserve to the side of the one, uh, so, so it helps you to avoid damaging the middle vein basically. It gives you some kind of direction to where is your transaction going to be.
then after we've done that, we started to transect the liver uh, with the harmonic. In the past, uh, so this video is, I think, three years or four years old because that instrument, I stopped using it. Uh, it's uh, a Lotus, uh, which is similar to the harmonic. It's a, a, a UK produced machine. Uh, at the moment, we use Thunderbeat most of the time. And the reason we use Thunderbeat because it has got a bipolar uh, instrument uh, integrated into the same uh, machine. So the transaction with the harmonic, uh, it doesn't, shouldn't be more than one centimeter depth. And after that, we will start to use the uh, uh, Kusa. So that's the Kusa where slowly and gradually you identify uh, most of the structures and then you take it one by one. I'll just slow it down here. So for example, this is a segment uh, five branch uh, that you can see it appearing there. This is under Pringles, so don't be surprised that there is no blood loss. So at the moment, there is Pringles going on. Usually, you get a little bit more bleeding when you don't use the Pringle. The setting of the Kusa, as you may know, I usually put it on the 2 plus setting. And the diathermy, usually, I put it on 70 spray. So when I want to relieve the uh, Pringles, uh, I will uh, close, I call it close the book. So basically close the uh, uh, transaction line and uh, relieve the uh, Pringles. That's, you can see now I'm relieving the Pringles so that give a breather to the liver and give the anesthetist time to count for me uh, how long out of Pringles. I, uh, uh, this is the time when I, so I, even if, if the camera is disturbed or the vision is not clear, during the Pringles maneuver, I tell everybody, my assistants and everybody, we're not going to do anything unless, unless it's completely disturbed vision. Uh, and I usually clean it. When the, the Pringles is being relieved, I take the camera out and start it to clean. Now I continue without Pringles. You can see that there will be slightly more blood loss. But until I see a disastrous bleeding, I wouldn't stop. I usually would continue and give the breather for the liver. You can see there is a vein now being exposed, and I think this could be branches for the uh, segment eight. I'm more now using the uh, Hemolox, the small Hemolox. There is a newly available Hemolox, which is uh, a five millimeter Hemolox. Uh, it's not the big ones, uh, instead of these metal clips. I find it more secure and um, it, in, particularly post-operatively, when you do post-operative scans, it doesn't disturb the pictures as these metal clips they do.
So the Pringles is still released. You can see it's lax, it's not tight. And I usually just confirm every couple of minutes because we have had incident in the past where the Pringles was not very lax and the, pay, and the, the, the liver can go into ischemia. And that's why I check it between now and then and check it, make sure that's completely relaxed. Now this is started to be just above the hilum, so that's why it's a little bit more uh, red color. And you can see the direction is I want to direct myself towards the right side of the vena cava. And gradually I go through what, if you want to call this segment nine, we usually call it segment nine, just for easy of identification. And, you can, and this is why we love the cruiser really. It just gives you better uh, vision of the anatomy, better vision of the vessels, and you don't clamp things blindly. I'm not taking, don't take me wrong. We, we use the, uh, the staplers quite often as well, but uh, as much as we prefer to use the cruiser before we use the stapler. And always, always, when you see the vessel, never clamp it directly or blindly. Always put your right angle or lay here behind it. It just helps you identify how big is your vessel and what kind of uh, hemolock is you going to use. Is it the gold or purple or green one? So now we've got enough time of Pringles. Now we're going back to Pringles. And you can see when you dissect with the Pringles, you just have a clear plane without any blood. Always use the right angle, just assess how big is the size of the vessel that you're going to clamp. Hemologs. Continue towards the back.
seems to be a bigger branches of the middle vein. So try to preserve some of it. That's likely to be segment eight branch. And then the same patient. That's after taking the specimen out. Some bleeding with the pressure, the problem, the bleeding may not be so obvious because you've got intra-abdominal pressure. So assess it well, and I usually try to stitch it if I can, if it continues to bleed. And now we take the Pringles out. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very informative, amazing presentation. <laughs> we can start by taking questions. Please, if you have a question, uh, uh, raise your hand so I can unmute you. Do you have any questions from the audience, Dr. Methat? Yes, uh, we observed that, uh, thank you for your lecture. We observed that cirrhotic liver uh, it doesn't have any propensity for liver metastasis, for example, in colorectal cancer. Do you have this observation too? Yes, uh, I don't know whether, so we, we have seen some metastasis in, in liver cirrhotic patients, but not the common one, I, I agree with you. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of uh, an official studies that looked at that. Uh, yeah, they so uh, How to investigate uh, just uh, such uh, finding? Yeah, could be, could be. Uh, but yeah. I'm not aware about an official review or study. It will be an important. The thing I would like to let you know is that we, uh, we're not very, so liver cirrhosis is not very common in the UK, by the way. Oh, it's I probably see. common. So that's why you may see it more than you, we see it. Uh, but we haven't got that many liver cirrhotic patients. Usually we get them with the HCC. Uh, yeah. we, we've done a few colorectal metastases with liver cirrhosis, but not many, I must say. Okay, thank you. It will be, if you have got the data, it will be very nice review, actually, if, if, you, uh, if you want to prove this theory. Maybe a few, few centers in Egypt where you have uh, liver cirrhosis uh, and, and compare it with metastases and without metastases. But I'm not aware about a scientific uh, study that can prove it. And in, in major resections, 
do you inject some dye in the common bile duct to see the any bile leakage or just? Uh, we don't sugar? do it. Yeah, I know some centers they do it. We don't do it. No. So the only thing I would do uh, before I remove the Pringle, I usually do the Pringles last last thing. Do it for a few seconds and make sure that there is no bile leak. Just have a look at the surface of the liver. No, oh, I see. Thank you. Dr. Ahmad Mustafa. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, my, my question regarding the metastatic colorectal cancer, if I have a small lesion, deep lesion that is less than three centimeters, uh, usually I do uh, the, the colon first and I send the patient for ablation uh, for these small lesions. But I noticed that this is not enough and they recur. Usually they recur. So even in a small lesion, still surgery is better than ablation? W I, what's totally, your opinion? Yeah, totally agree. I think surgery is better than ablation. So the criteria for ablation we use, if the patient is not fit for surgery, if the lesion, uh, so if you describe it like a lesion in segment six, seven, um, and very deep, not superficial, where you want to do right posterior sectionectomy or maybe right hepatectomy for this small lesion, and the lesion is two centimeter, and the patient is 75, for example, then we would balance it sometimes. We will say, okay, this guy may be better doing with a microwave ablation. But I totally agree proven that a, a surgery is superior. So if the patient is fit, definitely I will go for surgery. Even if it's small, deep, fit patient and small and yeah. deep lesions. Yeah, at, at the end of the day, I mean, it is, it is a patient decision in my yes. opinion. Yes. So I usually will give the patient, I will tell him, we do, so the ablation, the problem with ablation, it depends, do you do it yourself or you send it for your no, radiologist? I, I send it for radiologists. I, I noticed bad results with them actually. And this is, this is why I'm asking. Yeah, I, I must say uh, in Southampton, we have got, uh, I don't know whether you heard about him, Dr. Breen, David Breen, he's probably one of the best in microwave ablation worldwide. Yes, um, I, I, I. Yeah, He's doing amazing, mind, amazing uh, job, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. He does amazing jobs. But despite that, we say to him that we are better than you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, I agree, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I agree. If the patient, it depends. I think that, that decision will be based on the whole patient package. If somebody was 75, 80, and then, then it's a balance, whether you expose them to major surgery or you do the ablation. But surgery is better. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you have any more questions from the audience? Dr. Suleiman Shahs. Dr. Suleiman, we missed, we missed you. We haven't seen you for a while. If you, if you... <laughs> we used to meet with Dr. Suleiman quite often every year for the exam, but we haven't seen him for the last two years. Uh, he uh, lowered his hand, man. No, it's okay. Do you hear me? Yes. It's a pleasure to see you, Dr. Zaid, and I wish to see you again in Cairo, inshallah, next time. Inshallah. Uh, nice to meet you, and thank you for this very nice uh, presentation and uh, lecture. Um, uh, I would like to ask about the, the ablation you used uh, usually now is still uh, any rule of cryotherapy, any rule of, uh, uh, apart from radiofrequency, any, any rule of uh, phototherapy, laser, what kind of ablation do you use? So we use, uh, so the standards that we use is microwave ablation. Uh, available, available, the, um, um, the, the, uh, the, the cryoablation is available, but we don't use it to other liver. And the, uh, and the, uh, the electric ablation, I, I forgot what they call it. The, um, the radio frequency. Oh, yes, yeah. So we don't use it. We don't use it unless, unless it's very much nearer to the biliary structures. But the standard and the best one is microwave ablation so far. 
I think in Egypt we use the radio frequency. Uh, radio the frequency. Line, or, true. The difference between radio frequency and microwave is the time interval for waiting. Um, the we have got both machines, but the standards in Southampton we use microwave. I must tell you. Can you elaborate on the difference between both? What do you mean by time interval? So the microwave ablation is quicker than the radio frequency. Radio frequency, you need to wait for 10, 20, 15, 20 minutes to burn the liver completely, to, to burn the lesion. Whereas microwave, it gives you quicker results and you can compare it after. So what we do when we, when we do the fusion scans, we do post ablation scan and you can see the results very quickly if you have ablated enough zone with enough uh, margins. But I think as, as efficacy, both techniques are comparable to each other. And what usually the, the maximum size you can ablate, Dr. Zay? Three centimeter. Three we centimeter? Can, yeah, we can't, we expand it to three and a half, but we don't prefer. So we, we say three centimeter is the good one. Three and a half, we can do it. But we start, you know, we start to discuss, is it really better to resect or not to resect? We start to, dis to discuss these options. And, and of course, it all depends on the pa If the patient is not fit, then he, that's the only treatment he will have, unfortunately. It, 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 as I said, we don't do ablation unless there is something wrong with the patient himself. So unless he's not fit, bad for anesthesia, um, maybe recurrent disease or something else happening. He's, he's not that kind of candidate that you will take into theatre straight. Fine, that's fine. So in case, uh, and usually we can see this, in case there is liver mates or a lesion uh, about five centimeter, but it is uh, in the hilum nearly and very close to the major vessels. I, so yeah, that, uh, we, we don't ablate this one. Right, you'll go for so five, five centimeter, five centimeter close to the hilar vessels. We don't ablate it definitely. I mean, you will think for surgery or what? Yeah, we take it out. Okay, <laughs> okay, anyhow, nice to meet you. And uh, we have to see you in Cairo, inshallah. So, inshallah. thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Sham. Thank you. There was a question from one of the audience, Dr. Amsa, I think from Pakistan. She was saying in cases of double hepatectomies, which you illustrated before, what, what would you do in case of a recurrence? Liver transplant, uh, reconciliation, taste? Uh, so liver transplant is, uh, as you know, is still experimental in colorectal liver metastasis. So it isn't a common one. We do it, we refer it to our transplantations, but it is not common. So if there is a recurrence in this kind, we will still do metastatectomies. So, and I can show you some cases where we've done four re redo, redo, redo surgeries for them. Of mm. course, you don't have the luxury of doing major surgery anymore, but you just have to seek where is the lesion and take it out. Just pick up, pick yeah. out the list. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any more questions from the audience? Thank you very much, Hashem. Thank you. Okay, so I, do, I think we don't have any more questions. Thank you, Dr. Zaid. It was a very It's a pleasure presentation. to see you all, and thank you very much, my friends. Inshallah, we'll see you in Cairo very soon as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zaid, and thank you for your effort. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.